Hello everyone, my name is Manik Madan and in this video we'll talk about USMLE which stands for United States Medical Licensing Exams and everybody needs to give these to get into residency which is mandatory to practice medicine in US without residency you cannot practice medicine in the US so in this video we'll go up, like over the whole process of the USMLE from the exams to ECFMG certification, to the NRMP match, to interviews, to rank order list, to the match date, and finally residency, okay? So the whole process really starts with two main exams. The first one is step one, and then there's step two CK. So step one, I'll talk about, step two CK I'll talk about, okay? The third exam that I really wanna talk about is step three, is it is not a, mandatory exam that you need to give to get into residency you can even give it after you get into residency most people actually give step three after they get into residency uh, you also need to give this exam called oet which is actually a step to cs replacement right because now they cannot do step to cs so they have to replace it with an, another exam that can test your english skills which is a uh, occupational english test oet and once you give your step one step to ck and oet you can get ecfmg certified after ecfmg certification what happens is you can apply for something called as the nrmp match where the programs and the applicants will literally see what works for them. So the applicants apply to the match to different programs that they want to get in and the programs will see their applications. And if they like the person's application and the scores, they'll send them an interview. So that's basically the NRMP match. So you'll get an interview. After that, what happens is the rank order list. I'll get into this. So programs and the applicants rank each other uh, once they get the, like once they have the interview. And after the rank order list, we have this thing called the match date where the NRMP declares people who have matched or people who have not matched. And then once you're matched, you get into residency. So the whole process of USMLE starts with something called as ECFMG registration. So ECFMG stands for Educational Council for Foreign Medical Graduation. Now, this council is what allows us to really participate in the whole match and like allows us to become a doctor. So it's like for IMG. So ECFMG helps international medical graduates practice medicine in the US. So you have to get registered for it and you have to fill something called as form 183. Once you fill the form 183, you'll be eligible to write USMLE step one. And what has happened with the USMLE step one is, is it used to be a three digit numerical score uh, that used to come out of USMLE step one. So it used to be scored, but starting Jan 26, 2022, it will change to a pass fail system, number one. Number two, what the USMLE has announced this time is they are also gonna change the minimum passing score from 194 to 196. So they are kind of in a way making it a bit harder to pass, not that much of a difference I would say, but it is a change you need to be aware of. Uh, what, How much time you need to prepare for USMLE step one is somewhere between five to seven months, I think. You don't need much more than that. I took about seven months, so, uh, to prepare for it in my internship. And this test like mainly uh, tests your preclinical knowledge, that is your basic sciences, right? Your first and second year of med school. The exam is about eight hours, right? And it is divided into seven hours blocks. So seven blocks and one block is one hour. So seven hours, one block is about uh, 40 questions and so if we, if we have seven blocks so the whole step one exam is about 280 questions in total and then there's a one hour time period which is divided into a 15 minute orientation and a 45 minute break remember that this 15 minute orientation like if you you can actually do the orientation before doing the exam through the nbme's uh, website and if you do that you can convert this into your break time and then you can get like about a one hour break time so this is something you can do and people are not aware of that right that's the that's another thing you need to be aware of the resources that you need for usmle step one in brief are these it's called boof apps so b stands for boards and beyond these are the main videos then U stands for U World. So U World is the main question bank for USMLE Step 1. F stands for First Aid. P is Pathoma, S is Sketchy. So First Aid and Pathoma are the main books that I feel a lot of people, almost everybody who's preparing for USMLE Step 1 does. Sketchy is picture mnemonics and I would highly, highly recommend them uh, because they have made the whole thing very easy for me. So they are basically for micro. 
Uh, you can use them for micro, you can use them for farm, and then you can use them for pathology. So that's, they're very helpful. If you want uh, like a whole detailed overview on how to prepare for step one, I have two videos on this. One is seven steps to 260 on the USMLE step one. It will still be very relevant uh, even if step one goes pass fail. And uh, then I have another video I, uh, that, that's how I scored a 260 on USMLE step one. This is about an hour long, one hour long video. And in this you'll learn about everything you need to know about the step one, all the resources like other than the main ones that can help you in your prep. So do check them out, but later. Now let's dive into USMLE Step 2 CK. Now let's talk about USMLE Step 2 CK. So this exam is just test your clinical knowledge. How can you apply your basic clinical knowledge of medicine, OBGYN, uh, pediatrics, surgery, and it also has a lot of step one coming up because when I gave my step two CK, I, I saw like a few questions from biochem and a lot of other places. So it is step one material is coming up in step two CK and people are saying that this is gonna be the new step one because this is gonna stay numerical, right? So program directors do need a numerical scores to like, you know, because when there's just so many applicants, you need to somehow screen through them. So you do need numerical data. So since step two CK will remain a three digit score, uh, you, it will be used as like, you know, to, uh, see like which one should a person interview, which candidate one person should interview or not. Right. And step two CK is all about clinical knowledge. I took about 4.5 months to prepare for it. And uh, the thing about this exam is it's nine hours long. So it's a very long, very, very long. So that's about uh, one, one third of a day, right? It has about eight blocks and each block is one hour. So eight blocks. So in each block, there's about 40 questions and eight blocks is about 320 questions. So 318 to 320 questions is what you will get in the step to CK. There's also a one hour break. Uh, so there's also a one hour time period, which is divided into 15 minute orientation and a 45 minute break. You can again do the orientation before you go to the exam. So you can convert that into your break and have a one hour break. So that's something people also do. The resources in brief I would uh, advocate for, uh, for step two CK are U world, which is the main question bank boards and beyond just launched their step two videos. And it is like uh, people just saying it's really good. A lot of my friends are using it and they had a lot of, uh, a really good review for it. So you can try it, but I would say that, you know, if you have a solid step one foundation, step two CK is not going to be that hard for you because step two CK builds on step one knowledge. So you can just directly just do U world divine intervention podcast, which is something that is free. So you can just search this up. So it's a podcast by this guy, uh, called divine. And he is right now tr uh, in his transitional year for radiology. And he's made an amazing podcast for step to CK, which I think has a lot of high yield points and you can go over divine intervention podcast. Uh, I'll mention the link in the description below. The other thing I would highly, highly re like vouch for, for step to CK is the Amboss library. A lot of people read first aid step to CK for step two, but I have not seen a lot of good reviews for first aid step to CK because it's just not as good as what people have told me. I did not use it for my step to CK prep. And, um, I would instead vouch for Amboss library. It is the main book I think I use for step to CK because no matter like, so you can go to the Amboss library. It's all up to dated. Uh, so it's all updated. So it's according to up to date and various new resources. So it's totally updated. Number one, number two, it has high, very, very high yield material. So there's a button called high yield. So when you press that, you will only see the high yield material for let's say MI, right? So, and the third thing is you can search things up. So you go to the Amboss library and write stem I, right? And you'll get everything you need for stem I in like a page and you can press the high yield button and just get the high yield points for step to CK. I would highly, highly vouch for Amboss library. There's actually a trial on this. You can try it out for free and see if this works for you. I used it and I thought it was amazing. I have two videos. If you want to get into in detail prep of the whole USMLE uh, step to CK, the first one is how I scored a 271 on USMLE step to CK. So in this, I go over my whole preparation for step to CK. And I think it'll help you out a lot. The second video I have is how to prepare for the new USMLE step to CK, because a lot of the, the pattern of this exam has basically changed. And I would advise you to have a look at this. 
नाउ वंस यूर डन विद यूर स्टेप टू सी के इट्स टाइम टू राइट द ओ ई टी और द ऑक्यूपेशन इंग्लिश टेस्ट सो दिस इज एक्चुअली a replacement to the step to cs step to cs was recently discontinued because th- there is a big problem of covid and uh, because of that they ended up discontinuing step to cs so for oet i did not take a lot of time i i took i think about 4 to 5 days not much time uh, the resources that you need for this is the e2 oet free course and the official oet sample paper so you can search up e2 oet they have a big youtube channel watch their youtube videos they also have a free course so you can search uh, e2 oet free course for the oet you will get that and that will help you orient yourself to the whole exam right and after that i i would advise doing oet official sample papers for this whole exam so there is sample papers for reading writing listening and speaking yeah so occupational english test once we do that we can apply for something called as ecfmg certification right ecfmg certification just means that you have been certified by the ecfmg to be to be having as good as uh, clinical training as an american medical graduate and the way to apply for ecfmg certification is you need your usmle step 1 and step 2 seek Uh, step two uh, scores. Then you need your degree. For me, that would be MBBS. And then you need a letter of good standing from your university. Once you have all these things, you can apply for ECFMG certification, and then you can apply for the match. Now, one thing that you need to understand is you don't especially require ECFMG certification to apply for the match. But I would highly recommend it. The reason I'm saying that is because a lot of programs actually, like if you go to their website, they say that there's a requirement for ECFMG certification. Without that, they would not take your application and it would go to waste. And a lot of programs have that for the IMGs, right? So I would highly vouch for it. You can actually apply to the NRMP match without ECFMG certification with just your USMLE Step One score, and it is possible, and your degree, and like so, you can apply for that. But my view on that is, I would not vouch for that because what what would happen is, let's say you're applying to a uh, hundred programs or one fifty programs. What that would do is is a lot of those programs would not take you since you are not ECFMG certified. So you you'll just get like your application in into like. 20 30 or 40 programs and again even those programs would have other IMGs who would have ECFMG certification and who do you think they're going to prefer then right ECFMG certified people so again getting like ECFMG certified in time is very important according to me because it will just highly increase your chances of matching so once you get ECFMG certified the NRMP match starts so the NRMP match as i've already told you uh, is this thing where programs as well as applicants participate and what happens is it's like a match like dating right so what happens is you as an applicant will submit something called as your eras application where you'll have your professional experiences volunteer experiences research experiences personal statement lors msp medical transcripts and you will submit you will make something a big document called as your eras application or your era cv so once that gets done that will be presented to the programs that you have applied for like to interview at if they like your era cv or your eras application they are going to send you an interview and you are going to interview with them right so i'll get into that later so that is literally the whole match is you have applied with your eras application your scores everything to different programs and then they look at your uh, like are you good enough to interview at their program and then you'll get an interview so what does the eras application have So the first thing I want you to know about the ERAS application is it the main uh, things that people don't know about is professional experiences, volunteer experiences, and research experiences. So what this is is basically your experiences in the field of medicine in different things, right? Or like it could be not medicine if it's volunteer, right? So professional experiences are divided into two things: United States clinical experience, which is the most important thing because they want to know that you know stuff about the U.S. medical system. You have like lived the in in the U.S. medical system. You have seen how it is, and you are oriented to it because that that is what is valuable, right? You know. like things about their system so that carries a lot of value and then the second one is your home country uh, professional experiences like internship uh, or if you have done a job or if you have done residency in here so that goes into your home country uh, professional experiences volunteer experiences is anything that you did 
where you were not taking money for it. For example, uh, let's say you uh, went for uh, Red Cross, right? Red Cross is a, a N, like, so NGOs, right? So let's think about NGOs. So there's Red Cross, there's a Lion Club. So that is really volunteer experiences. After volunteer experiences, there, there are research experiences. So research experiences are any experience where you've worked in a team that was dedicated to research, right? It's not individual research. So let's say I write a review paper by myself. That would not be a research experience. Even though that might get published, I cannot put it in research experience. But if I have worked with a team where we were dedicated to publishing a single paper together or maybe multiple papers, right? That would count into research experiences. So that is an important distinction because people don't know that, right? If you want to learn about all of these, uh, like about how to get professional experiences, that is clinical rotations in the US, right? I have a whole video on that uh, called the USMLE uh, Clinical Rotations Masterclass, where we'll talk about LORs, what is letter of recommendations. Uh, and we'll talk about how USCE plays an important role in matching. And secondly, how to get it. There are three ways to get it. I, I talk all about it, but uh, watch it later. Right now, we'll just uh, go into this. Uh, the second thing is research experiences. I also have another video with Dr. Malki Azad, who is like published hundreds of publications and has thousands of citations where we talk about how to publish world-class research, how to get research experiences, how to publish on your own. So research experience or publications are not mandatory to match. You can match without it. However, they again are like, you know, something for your CV and make your CV glow more. And if you're interested, anyways, being interested in research is awesome. But even if you're not, try to get research because again, learning these skills are very handy for the programs and this would just boost up your CV even more and make you even more attractive in the whole match, right? However, in a few cases, research experience is very important and it is mainly important for competitive programs such as surgery. So if you want to get in surgery, I have not seen many people get into surgery without research experience and I've seen tons and tons people or of people get into surgery with like, you know, one year of research experience. So like it matters a lot for neurosurgery, for dermatology, for radiology, and for orthopedics. I think research experience is very, very important. If you get in, want to get into these competitive programs, you can watch the video again for how to get, uh, like how to publish world class research, uh, to know about more about research experience and how to get it. So this next thing is personal statement. So what is personal statement? Personal statement is basically why do you want into why do you want to get into a certain specialty? So let's say I'm applying for psychiatry, right? So I'm going to write a whole person statement about my whole life, my life experiences that have made me want to go for psychiatry. And they like through the person statement, they just want to know what is your motivation to get into that branch. And let's say you get into that branch. What will you do next? Let's say, right? What will you do for them? What are your aspirations? What do you want to become? Let's say I want to go into China and adolescent fellowships, right? I'll mention that. So that's most of what is personal statements. Uh, I'll make a video about this, like once I match, cause uh, at the moment I cannot uh, talk much about it, but I will make a video later about it. Another thing to know about is LORs, which are letter of recommendations. So LORs, uh, so let's say you did USCE, right? You went to do clinical rotations in the US. So LORs or letter of recommendations are divided into two things. The first one, is US LORs, so US LORs, and then there are home country LORs. LORs are written by professors or uh, attendings who are practicing medicine um, in, I, in any country, let's say US or home, and they are basically a testament about your qualities as a physician, uh, like how good you are uh, in communication, uh, in your cultural values, professionally, and they're just like uh, a statement where somebody's vouching for you in some way, right? So when you do your US clinical experience, you will get US LORs and US LORs are more valued than home country LORs. So you, you can also get home country LORs, let's say, uh, I live in India, right? I uh, can ask any of my Indian professors in the specialty that I'm applying for, let's say psychiatry, I can ask psychiatry professors to write an LOR for me. That would be a psychi home country psychiatry LOR. However, again, US LORs are more valued than home country LORs because a US physician vouching for you is more valued than a home country physician vouching for you because the US physicians know the US system better and they can better assess you and your qualities in the context of the US healthcare. And that's what a lot of programs want is somebody like putting that stamp of approval on you 
that hey this guy knows what he is doing or uh, this person knows what he is doing so that's something right so that's lors so you can upload a maximum of four lors per program and um, a lot of people just upload like let's say about two or three lors from us and one lor from their home country i actually went for four clinical rotations so i uploaded four us based lors because i just wanted to make my statement super super strong then there is something called as the mspe medical school performance evaluation what mspe is really is your school really evaluating you in multiple things first character second how was your basic sciences per per performance like you know let's say in the first and second year then how was your clinical performance in third and fourth year and also not only that how was your how's your clinical knowledge how did you perform in your rotations so it's basically your evaluation compared to your peers in your medical school and if you're in the top 25% what that means is you are in the dean's list which is again very really good so msp is something that uh, also like you know you should know about then last one is medical school transcripts so medical school transcripts are basically your performance in different clinical examinations let's say for first year physiology anatomy biochemistry for second year there'll be pathology pharmacology all of that and your marks uh you know that will be displayed in the medical school transcripts according to the year so there will be a medical school transcript for the first year second year uh so all your marks will be mentioned in medical school transcripts and you get this from a medical school after that are interviews so once you submit your eras application uh and the deadline for that used to be september 15th but this year because of coronavirus it got delayed to september 29th what will happen is after you submit your eras application after that you'll start getting interviews right and in once like and then you'll start scheduling them uh once you start scheduling them you'll uh, and the interviews are really like they are held uh, for about 4 months in total from october november december january a few people also interview in february but that's very rare but mainly it's in 4 months october november december january and you will keep getting interviews throughout this month and you can get like any interview any month and once you start getting your interviews you'll basically interview with the program so right now what we are doing is virtual interviews we are not going into the program which used to be the, the case is we had in person rotation or uh, in person interviews before where you have to fly to uh, that program and then like interview there have like a pre interview dinner and then interview at that program the next day right now it's all virtual so we have like i have 4 to 6 hours of interviews so some interviews are 4 hours long some interviews are 6 hours long for me and basically in interviews you will interview with three people and this is mainly the case but not always the first one would be the program director the second one would be the chief resident the third one would be associate pd and professor again this is a rule of thumb this is not always true uh, people can vary there can be interviews where you don't interview with the program director but yeah it's it's all that so in an interview what they are really assessing is is like they want to know for sure that you are really good in your english and uh, you can answer ethical questions behavioral questions mostly they are not going to test you based on your medical knowledge but what they are trying to see is how you are professionally how do you speak uh, how is your english and all of that and once you are done with your interviews uh, what happens is once this all happens is you'll write your thank you letter of course you should write a thank you letter to every single person and you can send it by either post or through email it's up to you and once that's done in is in february there's something called as rank order list so what happens is the programs they have their own rank order list applications make their applicants make their own rank order list and what are rank order list is let's say uh, i interviewed at x number of programs so i'll start rating them from 1 to x right so i'll start in uh, rating them like based on my preference from 1 to x the programs will also do that since the programs have multi like interviewed multiple applicants they'll start ranking them from 1 to y right so 1 2 3 applicant number 1 applicant number 2 applicant number 3 and what happens in the match is there's this thing called the match date and match date is almost all the time on the monday and this monday is the third week of march right on the third week of march the monday uh, you are told like in an uh, in a email that whether you matched or not and this all is based on the rank order list uh, so there will be an algorithm running which will match the program with the applicants based on the rank order list and based on that you will be told which program you match in on the friday and so you are you'll you're actually not told which program you are matched 
in on Monday. Monday is just like whether you match or not. It's basically on Friday of the third week of March. Do you really get to know which program did you match in? And that's the called the program reveal. So Manik, like you would be asking Manik, why is there this big delay from Monday to Friday? Like why do the programs want you to wait so much? The answer is people who do not match between this delay can apply for something called a SOAP. And that stands for Supplemental Offer and Acceptance Program. So you basically call programs, ask them if they have any unfilled spots and you try to fill them, right? If you are unmatched. So that's why there is this delay from Monday to Friday so that people who have not matched can match. And on Friday, we, we just like everybody has just this stability and everybody just knows uh, if they matched or not. And it's just uniform. Uh, now let's talk about USMLE Step 3. So USMLE Step 3 is not a requirement to match. You can surely like IMGs actually can do it before matching and it can increase your chances of matching because you're already done with step three. The program does not have to worry about your step three. But again, it is not a requirement. A lot of people match without giving USMLE step three. AMGs actually cannot give step three before matching because they're actually in their fourth year of medical school. So they can't do it because they're not graduates. Only graduates can write it. So uh, let's talk about USMLE step three. Most people uh, give it in their PGY1 or PGY2 and a lot of programs have this requirement where they will not allow you to transition to PGY3 if you have not passed step 3. So just know about that. Step 3 is a two day exam. The first day is called foundations of independent practice where they're just going to test like your basic sciences knowledge, your clinical knowledge, both step one and step two kind of in an MCQ manner. It's seven hours long. It's divided into six and one hour, about one hour, I would say. In these six hours, you you have six blocks and each block is about one hour. So six hours, right? And there are about 232 MCQs you need to solve. And there are 38 to 39 MCQs per block. Then in that one hour, you have a 45 minute break, which you can take again after doing a block. And it's up to you uh, how long you want to take it. And um, yeah. And then there is a 15 minute orientation. Again, if you do the orientation before uh, going to step three, you can actually convert it into uh, more of your break time. The second day, right? After the first day, there's the second day exam. Now you don't necessarily have to write the second day exam, which is the CCS cases in advanced clinical medicine on uh, consecutive days. You can write it like at about I think a maximum of a week's delay. So it should like the delay between the first and the second day should be less than the week. The second day is all about advanced clinical medicine and CCS cases. It's basically your they're testing your ability, uh, history taking, physical examination, patient care. They're testing those aspects of your knowledge. It's about nine hours long, nine hours long and it's divided into six blocks of MCQs where one block is about 45 minutes each. So you have 180 MCQs for like, so 30 MCQs per block. That's six blocks of questions. And then you have 13 CCS cases after these six blocks. So CCS cases are basically uh, these software based cases where you are kind of, uh, they're testing you in an artificial simulation uh, on your ability to deliver patient care. Like, would you admit the patient to the ED or would you, uh, admit them to the ward or would you take them to your office like they're testing different aspects of it what medicine would you give them and there's like infinite number of possibilities that you can do with the ccs cases so that's something but really it's just an artificial simulation of step to cs in a manner if you've done step to cs this is like an artificial simulation of that just to make sure that you as a doctor know what you're doing so that's ccs cases now the last thing i want to just say is my thoughts on the match so the most beautiful thing about the USMLE is there is no guarantee. If you have high step scores, right, let's say, and you have all the USC in the world, you have the best LORs, you have the best application. Yes, you have a very good chance at matching, but that again is not guaranteed. There have been cases where people have the best things, but due to some problem or maybe red flag that did not match. Then there are people who don't have those high scores and they don't have much USCE, but they still match. And there are certain reasons, maybe the program liked their personal statement, they liked what uh, their LO writers wrote about them. So there could be several things uh, regarding that. So USMLE is basically screening for both quantity and quality. Quantity is scores, quality is your uh, LORs, your personal statement, the way you interview. So, and how, how does your interview go? That's very important too. So you might have everything in the world and still not match and you might have not much, but you like 
based on scores, but you might have really good USCE and you might match. So, but, and the thing that I want to bring across is there is no guarantee. So that's something to know about in this thing. However, I still think it's worth the risk because I have seen a lot of cases that go unmatched, but what they end up doing is they end up doing like, let's say a one year or a two year research elective. They go there, get more LORs, do more research, improve their application, and then apply again for the match. And they end up matching. My senior actually had this issue, but he ended up matching. Even though he went unmatched the first year, he did a research elective for one year, and then he ended up matching. So you can do research electives and CV building. And in the end, you might still match. So I think it's worth the risk. It's, it's not just scores, right? Let's say you just have low scores. That just doesn't take you out of the game. You can improve in your CV, go do research electives, go do more USE, and that can get you in. So that's again a good part, that quality aspect. You can always improve on that quality aspect if you don't have the quantity aspect. If you want to know the total cost, the total cost of the USMD journey for me was about $20,000. And I've actually made a whole video about like the total cost of USMLE uh, in a video called the total cost of the USMLE journey. You guys can check that out when you have the free time. So thank you for watching. I just wanted to say thank you. And if you like this video, please like and subscribe, share this video. It helps a lot. And let me know in the comments, what do you want to watch next? Thank you. Take care.